Well, this is Seymour Rocks uh, reporting from Down Under. I'm back again, uh, this time to talk about the New Zealand election. So this last weekend saw an election in New Zealand. The results of the election were easily foreseen. It was no shock. The people, driven by fear, delusion, and I suppose gratitude for being delivered from what is a COVID-19 pandemic, people are so grateful. We seem to have even found a solution to the common cold and flu by getting people to wear masks and hide away. It's just a pity that it has cost the economy and the many other aspects of our uh, national life uh, to get this, this wondrous result. I've been far more interested and concerned by events as they are unfolding in the United States at the moment. And uh, I was so interested in the election results in New Zealand as they were coming in that I went to bed at my usual time, which is about 8pm. Although I did uh, uh, share a few things with my partner Pam uh, uh, from there. Anyway, I'm so uh, disenchanted with uh, New Zealand politics and politics in general that I was not going to vote at all. But um, based on the scurrilous campaign, again, uh, in the days leading up to the election against a small party, uh, uh, that opposes the government on on the pandemic, as well as on the uh, its new world order policies and cuddling up to China, that I did not get up, but I did get out to vote, and I voted on the basis of that for a party which got twenty thousand votes, despite having seventy thousand people listed and 59,000 regular donations. So I'm not going to say that this was a rigged election. Uh, I don't really think that we've uh, had that uh, uh, that tradition in this country. However, uh, some people on social media have suggested that uh, that this might be the case. Uh, but there are certainly some glaring irregularities. Uh, and the first was that a day or so before Saturday's election, just a day, I think, uh, Facebook took down Advanced New Zealand's uh, page that's Billy Tikahika's party uh, on the grounds of uh, multiple infractions against community guidelines. So, given the perfect timing just before the election uh, and the riddle of the results, which I've just identified, I find it hard to say that this is a coincidence and Facebook uh, just happened happened to choose this moment to to uh, take action against Facebook. Nothing, of course, can be proven, but it, in my mind, it's highly suspicious. And I've heard some rumours that I've been unable to confirm that the debt-ridden government uh, gave $53 million to Facebook. To Facebook! One of the biggest corporations in the world. They gave $53 million? So what if this true? The New Zealand government being able to rely on the social media giant to come to the rescue and remove the presence of a highly inconvenient party that got under their skin. Now the second episode involves uh, Winston Peters, who has been in... New Zealand politics since the early 80s. He's our most senior politician and he's 
often got under the skin of various governments. So uh, it's Winston Peters that the public has been taught to hate. So they they did terribly in the election. They got, I don't know, what was it, 3% of the vote or whatever. So in the days leading up to the election, a case uh, was brought to the Serious Fraud Office about the New Zealand First Foundation connected to Winston Peters, its, its, its leader. That's uh, Winston Peters. He was... Uh, largely instrumental in keeping the government in power, uh, but he also provided some sort of a check and perhaps a counterweight to the other left-wing parties, uh, Labour uh, and uh, and the Greens. So my suspicion from what I've seen is that he became, towards the end, uh, towards the election, he was a bit more critical of, of the government that he participated in, and he became inconvenient. So I'm unaware of all the details, but this has happened before. It's happened to Winston Peters. When governments want to get rid of themselves of an inconvenient presence, then suddenly there's a, uh, a scandal. So I've watched this since... since um, uh, the election and Winston Peters, who is our most senior politician, and I would say senior statesman, has been almost disrespected and certainly not given the accolades that I think are due to him. And I have some respect for him because he's just a straight speaker. He's revealed a lot of dirty secrets during his time in Parliament, and he's the only politician across the board from any party who's ever talked about the astronomical debt levels and the trouble that our economy is in. So just have a listen uh, briefly to a couple of sentences of what he said in his, his speech on election night. You all recall that in 2017, after election night, we predicted an economic crisis, and sadly, it's here. Its effects have not been well canvassed, but if there's one cause for grave disquiet, it is the nature of the economic crisis not being properly understood. This was an election that, because of COVID-19 and extended lockdowns, was like no other this country has ever seen, even in wartime. To those who have been successful tonight, our congratulations and best wishes. Peters has been the only one to have pointed out that this economic crisis preceded uh, but was made worse by the COVID crisis. Uh, he, he made a warning back in uh, the end of 2016 when he made the decision to, uh, to join the government. Um, so... I felt more and more like an internal exile on a distant and isolated island because, in my perception, I'm surrounded by such denial that there is a serious problem. None of this is a problem. Everyone thinks that Jacinda's made such a fantastic job. So let's just have another look at the debt levels. I did a quick back of envelope calculation. New Zealand's government debt, and who knows what the private debt levels are, at $96 billion is huge. The US government debt that we can agree is through the ceiling is 279 times that of New Zealand, while the population of the United States, according to my calculation, is a full 667 times that of New Zealand. So what does that say? Houston, we have a problem. And yet, there is almost complete, total denial across the board. Why not just keep borrowing into infinity and doubling the money supply 
when there's almost nothing in the economy to even start to pay it off. I don't know offhand what tourism's share in our export earnings, but it's completely dried up. There's no one coming into the country and there's practically no real economy left. Then uh, there's this, where uh, New Zealand already, prior to all of this COVID stuff, was right at the bottom of the UNICEF um, league tables as far as child poverty are concerned, and we've got the highest teen, uh, suicide rate in the world, and, it, and that's also mushroomed under all of this. And then this, this. Jacinda Ardern has pledged $65 million for arts and culture. And yet the pickers who come from the Pacific Islands every year to pick the fruits and vegetables have been refused entry into New Zealand. So the uh, the fruits and vegetables are just rotting on the ground. Right, as we heard earlier this morning, Immigration New Zealand has granted border exemptions to some offshore musicians to participate in the Summer Winery Tour, 29 I think. And as uh, all rugby fans are well aware, immigration accommodations have been made for the Australian rugby team, plus the English netball team and the West Indies and Pakistan cricket teams and the America's Cup teams. But for experienced seasonal fruit pickers, even from completely COVID-19 free Samoa, they haven't had a single case, our borders remain shut. Joining us to unpack why this is such a big problem, even putting at risk hundreds of tonnes of fresh fruit. Given that our traditional trading partners are in their own deep shit, I suppose now the answer is to cuddle up to China even more than we have in the past. And that is something that I think is going to happen. And I'm not the only one to say it. This is Sky News in Australia. I did pick up a couple of interesting things from the coverage I heard on election night. party or even the small ones don't talk about the dramatic change that's going to happen in the workforce with artificial intelligence driving much of the machinery and the technology that we're going to have and the dramatic impact that's going to have on the world of work and nobody wants to talk about it. The and our own ex-Prime Minister Helen Clark who was in power for a couple of uh Terms, three terms, I think, between two, 2000 and 2009, who I suspect might be eyeing up a vacancy for the UN Secretary General's job when it becomes vacant, said something that it would be very, very hard to see as anything other than code for the Great Reset, uh, so beloved of the World Economic Forum. Well, I, I think the, the first thing on everyone's mind is is how do we go from here with the response to COVID? Because there's clearly no return to the kind of international tourism we had or the student numbers uh, from offshore. And, and that accounted for around 25% of New Zealand's export dollar revenue. So it's not a small amount. So I think it, it's going to be how the government can lead uh, and, and work across sectors to uh, bring new sectors of the economy forward because the old economy we're not going to see uh, again. So there we have it. Um, we have a, a New Zealand economy uh, that was already 
in uh, deep trouble before, and then we have uh, a uh, pandemic, or should I say a, a pandemic, which has given them the excuse to close everything down, and we're going to have social distancing between now and uh, infinity. And of course, uh, we have a very real uh, climate, I won't even say crisis, I think it's set in stone, um, it's going to destroy everything, is destroying everything. Um, and in the midst of all of this, as Helen Clark said, we've got the Great Reset. Uh, the old economy is has gone away and the new economy uh, is to be set in its place. And uh, so New Zealand is playing a central role in a globalist uh, agenda. And um, yeah... Well, let's just see if uh, the population of New Zealand wake up or they remain firmly asleep like little hobbits uh, for the next three years, just accepting what comes next. Anyway, <laughs> it's enough from me at Seymour Rocks, reporting from Down Under.